We've got uh, three of the uh, principal stars, organizers of this group. And uh, you know, I, I even hesitate to break up such a nice party here. Everybody seems to be enjoying the food, uh, the drink, and uh, I don't know if things go much easier after a couple of glasses of wine, but I guess we'll find out. Uh, well, what we would do here is um, just a quick one, two, three on strategy, forces, and budgets, and get a couple of takeaway points from um, from three of the, uh, of the panelists, and then uh, just let you guys ask questions until we drop here, uh, or at least until five o'clock or so, whichever comes first. So uh, I think we're going to start actually. Uh, with takeaway points on the issue of strategy. And Pat Walsh, Edmund Walsh, is going to, uh, to give us a couple of points on that. Pat? Uh, thanks, Jim. First of all, uh, I really want to congratulate the conference organizers here because I thought there was a terrific turnout in the audience as well as some very, very esteemed colleagues who had an opportunity to speak. I thought it was a, a resounding success, Jim, and congratulations. Thank you. Excellent, Jim. We couldn't have done it without Pat. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, I, was, uh, I was really grateful for the, uh, the give and take that you guys let me and Bob have, uh, because it, it allowed us to clarify, I think, uh, issues that are going to be the real challenges uh, looking into the future. And so when you think about <clears throat> the interesting contrast here throughout the symposium was the short term versus the long term. Mm -hmm. and, and notice how, at least on the, on the panel we had this morning, we ended up talking about people when it was all over with. And uh, just the whole need for a human capital strategy. Yep. So. <clears throat> So I'm, I'm going to take my comments with a question back to you. Okay. So, so, when you look at, so when you look at the level of effort chart that we put up last mm -hmm. night, yep, yep. which was really put there by demand from Bob. He, he wanted one PowerPoint <laughs> slide. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you look at the picture now with the benefit of all the discussion that was going on. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that the chart really played out in the course of the day. Uh -huh. and, Michael, what that looked like was uh, what the what the general purpose forces looked like in the pre-9/11 world, mm -hmm. which were forces that could really swing from one lesser contingency to the next. Mm -hmm. um, never really used or intended to use in counterinsurgency. Never expected to be used for thermonuclear war, but it was the force for uh, <coughs> deterrence to the uh, Warsaw Pact. And in the post 9-11 world, when you look at, at where we were in terms of the spectrum of, of uh, the range of military operations, we were in the lower left-hand corner. And in terms of the frequency, we were predominantly in the counterinsurgency world. And it took a while, and it took investment in order to get there. But over time, what we've seen now is with that investment, we see this, this growing sort of issue here with the nation-state actor. And, and what to do about it. And how do, you, how do you manage yourself and your forces in a way that's smart and precise so you don't, so you don't cause the very problem you're trying to avoid. And, and so that was, that was part of the discussion last night that bled over into this morning. Um, I was, uh, I was uh, really grateful for the audience participation and, and I thought everyone was uh, really energized and enthusiastic about continuing that conversation forward and, and I thought it played out well. Well, that's uh, comments on strategy. Um, Bob, you want to talk a little bit about forces? Forces, yeah. First of all, again, Jim, this was terrific. It's the best one we've had. It gets better every year. Okay, thanks. thanks to you and Lynn. Where's Lynn? She's there. So there she is. Um, uh, let me just hit you with a couple of bullets because I think we've uh, we've talked a lot about it. Let me talk about oppos Let me talk about oppositions for a moment. Uh, and I have about six of them that came out of today. I found so fascinating. Uh, one is the idea of balanced versus focused forces. This is huge. A balanced force is one that covers as much of the, uh, uh, to Pat's point, as much of the, what we used to call years ago, spectrum of conflict as possible. 
And the more you spread across the spectrum of, and I'm drawing a PowerPoint slide in the air here, <laughs> but the more you can spread that spectrum of conflict, the greater you reduce the risk, the lesser your ability to concentrate at a point, which is what Pat was talking about. So if you just say have an oval on the, on the left, the special forces, in the middle that's Marines, uh, Army towards the higher end, and you have Navy and Air Force that cover the, cover the span, that's a balanced force, a focused force of one that's theater specific, either say China or the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And that's a key question, and it affects everything. It affects strategy, stationing, material development, and so forth. The second is this issue of capabilities versus scenarios. This came out in our discussion. Uh, do, you, do you build your force on a strategy that's built around making better what you have now and enhancing capabilities? Or do you pick the classic five scenarios and build a force against each of those scenarios? When I was a kid, we had a two and a half war strategy. That was easy. You apportioned so many forces towards each of the strategies. You figured out what the risk was and how much time it took you to get from one uh, uh, hot spot to the other, and that was your national strategy. You can't do that anymore. So that's the other tension that's with us. Um, and, and, and the next is, is this whole idea of people versus operations versus material, what Pat was talking about. I fall on the side of people. I think uh, the greatest, uh, Barry McCaffrey once said when asked in Congress uh, how good our stuff was in Desert Storm. And he said, I think prophetically, we could swap material with the Iraqis and we'd still kick their ass. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that's true because what's different is the quality of the people. We have an NCO Corps. There are only four nations in the world that have chiefs and NCOs like America does. Uh, in spite of how much we beat each other up uh, today uh, about, uh, about officer education, we have an incredibly experienced uh, and well-educated officer corps. Um, and so that's, I believe, when we go to war tomorrow, the thing that spreads ourselves across the spectrum is the adaptability of our people to, to adapt themselves to different situations rather than buying stuff that fits in each of those. Um, sustain versus build new. Um, this is interesting because I know Haas writes about this a lot. Uh, the point is that our major machines of war have hit a capabilities plateau. You can't get ships to 100 knots, you can't get airplanes to Mach 5. So the thing that's made a difference is to take what we have now, uh, sustain what we have now, and make things better with the network, with sensors, UAVs, um, and all those a cool technology is where we still lead the world, and we still have places to expand as we move into the future. And frankly, while it may seem expensive to you, those of us who have sponsored large weapon systems, it's actually pretty cheap. Um, offensive versus defensive. Mike talked about this. Um, and I think he's spot on. Do we, do we attempt to have a forward presence? Do we attempt to stick our noses in the business of other nations? Uh, or do we retract, as is the traditional American uh, penchant, do we retract within ourselves and begin to have a continental strategy where we protect the homeland? My sense is, given the mood of the American people, that their, their inclination is more for the latter than the former. Uh, and then we come to the whole issue of the black swan and the historical period of discontinuity. One of the things that we, one of the reasons we can use old stuff in a new way is because we haven't had a period of historical discontinuity in the art of war since the atom bomb. But as if, if any of you have ever read the book, The Black Swan, remember when a black swan occurs, this is a totally, this is a rending in the historical fabric which causes a period of discontinuity and makes all the old stuff irrelevant. Uh, are, is there in our immediate future a black swan? Is there an epochal shift? And if that's the case, then many of us, other than our people, will have to start over. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, when it comes to threats, we love to, you know, Pat and I went round and round about fighting China. But, <laughs> but I, 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 think, I, I think that the, the problem in the future, the only thing that ties together our potential enemies, those who seek to do us ill, well, and that continues to get worse, is this 
rift between the have and the have nots. Haas talked about this. 20 degrees north and south of the equator uh, uh, versus the rest of the world. And the temperate swath, which includes China, by the way, continues to advance. And the, and the, and the tropical swath uh, continues to, uh, to fester. And I think as time goes on, particularly as the tropical swath does any number of things, generates diseases, develops a nuclear weapon, uh, expands terrorism, uh, uh, breaks into uh, 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 narco-terrorism, and, so, and all these other bad things can happen in the world. I think in the future, if, God forbid, we ever go to war again, it's not going to be nation-state versus nation-state. It's going to be this rift in global society. By the way, there's nothing different than that, than the Greeks, the Romans, the Persians, the Mongols, the Germans, <laughs> you name it. It's been like that for the whole course of recorded history. Budgets. First of all, that was great, and so was the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the Admiral and the General just, just described most of human history up until now and most of human history into the future. And, and I couldn't even think of anything really to even slightly critique. I'm, I'm just going to find one slight little um, you know, somewhat more optimistic note on General Scales' last point and then talk budget very briefly. Um, there are at least two countries near the equator, three that are doing okay. And let's hope, and you weren't saying that the whole place is shot, no. you were just saying that it's got greater challenges, and I agree. But uh, Colombia, mm -hmm. Brazil, Indonesia, right. for all very different reasons. But let's hope that that can be, you know, uh, it, it's funny, uh, there aren't that many people who talk inspirationally and optimistically about the future of the world. Uh, we've heard a little bit of it in this conference, and I think we should. I've, I've heard um, Bill Gates talk this way. And uh, he's pretty good. He basically says, we're keeping more people alive than ever before. Child mortality's way down. Middle classes are way up. Uh, yes, we have all these huge problems in the world sustaining this, but human history has never been looking so good. And it's partly, you know, it's worth keeping that in mind as you also think about where our grand strategy has been successful, what you guys have accomplished in your careers, and what others in this room have as well. It's been a remarkable uh, set of accomplishments, and the opportunities we now have going forward are pretty darn good. But I will now come back to the budget, and I will say that uh, while there are a number of ways that the world's future happy prognosis that I believe in could go awry, uh, one of the most worrisome is our economy and our budget deficit. And I'm just going to say a couple of very quick things. And the last panel was tremendous, and I really thought the last panel did a great job not only of, not only of talking really smartly and precisely uh, and not getting too much into the defense budget weeds, but also doing it with a sense of humor and with a sense of uh, some takeaways you could grab onto. Uh, so thank you for that. And just to build on a couple of the points, let me just say, okay, we have roughly a trillion dollar deficit right now in our country, the annual federal deficit. Some of that's due to economic weakness and recession, or not recession, but weak growth. So it should hopefully get a little better. But even if we have a goal of only cutting it in half, that's gonna be pretty hard. And let me just very quickly mention in back of the envelope style, what might be needed. First of all, uh, Social Security. If you were to raise the retirement age by two years and you were to adjust the, uh, you know, the cost of living formula somewhat so that it rose by half a percent a year less, you save $100 billion in annual expense by 2020 or so. We, we gotta do that. Um, but the point is even doing those two things, which is not hugely difficult but also not hugely easy, only gets you $100 billion. And, um, and then taxes, and we just heard a very good presentation about taxes, and even if you were to repeal all the Bush tax cuts, uh, which nobody in Washington really wants to do right now, you get uh, maybe 400 billion in, in annual deficit reduction, but to get even 200 billion is gonna be very hard. So let's hope for 200 billion. And a lot of people in this room, since I'm in the state of Texas, uh, are probably gonna throw me out even for proposing a number like that. So maybe, we should, maybe I should say 100 billion. Um, but anyway, so let, let me say 100 billion. Uh, that'll be my bipartisan gesture for the day. Uh, so, so, so we got 100 billion, in, 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 and, and we can always say it's because the economy's growing faster because we did it the smart Republican way, and we, you know, we, we, we did it in a way that facilitated economic growth, and, 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 and any small increase in rates was the smaller part of the thing, or, or we can reduce the deductions and exemptions, but let's just posit another 100 billion in annual revenue. And then, you know what? Um, I really think a lot of those domestic accounts that, have, that are designed for science research, for food safety, for drug safety, 
We're all living with that recent terrible tragedy for uh, infrastructure development, for um, taking care of our veterans, for our diplomacy, a lot of the things that are considered to be discretionary funding, at least in part, those things are already being cut pretty hard by the Budget Control Act. Now the popular images, these are all bridges to nowhere, right? When Congress, people th think of this as Congress's pork projects or the, you know, the bridge to nowhere in Alaska, but it, really what drives the budget in all these domestic and international discretionary areas is the stuff I just said. Infrastructure, science, safety. We're not gonna cut that by a huge amount, and it's already slated to go lower as a percent of our GDP than it was at any time under Reagan, any time under Clinton. So I think it's actually been cut enough in the first trans tranche of the budget. I wouldn't cut these anymore. Now, Mitt Romney did a great job in the debates, I thought, of underscoring how much food stamps have grown, and that probably needs to be reined in. There's probably some room for economies there. Uh, but my, I'm working on a little paper now with my colleague Ron Haskins, who's a Republican who helped a lot with welfare reform in the 90s on the Hill. And he thinks that sort of the, the welfare and means-tested accounts can be cut somewhat, but less, proportionately speaking, than most of the rest of government. So let's give maybe $50 billion a year in these accounts. Okay, and then healthcare reform. This is the big enchilada. To Republican friends, I would say, okay, even though you're not gonna be able to repeal Obamacare, uh, given the outcome of this election, and even though you're also not gonna be able to send Medicaid as a block grant to the state, given the outcome of this election, don't worry, because you have two possible outcomes over the next four years, either one of which should make you very happy. Either will prove that Obamacare doesn't work, in which case we'll need another debate on it in 2016 to come up with a different health care reform plan. Or we will have begun to solve the problem, in which case our children's economic futures will be better. Either way, you have a new, either a new debate on all the same issues that were raised in 2012, Medicaid as a block grant to the states, for example, new kinds of health care reform, or we begin to see that there's some aspects of Obama's ideas that are working and we build on those. But either way, you're not going to get a lot of additional savings out of this because we're going to stay for the next four years, more or less, since Obama won the election, you're not going to have Obamacare overturn. It's just not going to happen. So you're going to do very well to get $50 billion in health care savings per year in the next four years, above and beyond the legislation that's already been passed. Bottom line, defense is going to have to probably try to give a little more. Not because those of us who believe in a strong national defense can see all sorts of easy additional savings, but just because the deficit itself is so hard to slay and it's such a threat to our own economic and national security well-being over time. So I come back to that point. I don't think we can do any big additional cuts, but I think we got to at least stick with the Obama cuts and maybe look for a few more, more modest efficiencies here and there. We do all that, we can cut the deficit in half. And um, as was said earlier, that's become the equivalent now politically of saying that we solved the deficit problem. So I'll take that as good enough for the next round. Okay, well, I, I think I want to start my uh, comment and then before we move to the audience, just by saying uh, how incredibly impressed I am uh, by some of the leadership that we have in this country and particularly in our military. Uh, we are so lucky, I mean, everybody, some of the non-military, uh, some of us civilians uh, were comment commenting on how, uh, how impressed we were by the panelists. Uh, and this includes not only, I guess we got phones, phones interfering with the, uh, the microphone. No, no, okay, there you go, turn it down. Um, how incredibly impressed they were with the participants. This includes not only our own Admiral Walsh and General Scales, uh, who has been with us throughout this odyssey for five or six years with this program. We're so grateful for Raytheon for supporting this program. Uh, we wouldn't be here if we're not for Raytheon. I think they've all uh, gone back to work uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, stave off uh, the cuts and the drop in business that's coming. <laughs> Laurie's still here. Um, but also General Zanini, who's here. General Dunn, who is here. I mean, I, I think we ought to stop for just one second, Colonel Pryor, who's standing over here, and just think about how lucky we are to have people like this uh, who lead uh, our uh, defense efforts in this country. Why don't we all, all give them a hand? Huh? If I could just bring us back for one second to where we started uh, last night <clears throat> with uh, uh, the little college professor 
uh, his bow tie, his horn rim glasses, uh, the tweed jacket. Uh, I used to see him and his wife getting on planes in Boston, Massachusetts. This was Kenneth Waltz. Um, you weren't here last night, but Pat walked us through the sort of Waltzian approach to this issue of strategy, forces, and budgets. And I see Michael already shaking his head here. Um, Man the State and War. I mean, what, a, what an incredible book. Uh, you know, do we have to focus just on the individual? Is it the individual that we have to worry about? You know, think about those non 19 guys with box cutters. I mean, when, when in history have we seen individuals play that kind of role on the world stage? Is that where the threat is? I mean, we invented a whole department, I think, the Department of Homeland Security uh, that grew out of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, you know, was that, a, was that a black swan event? Is that what really transformed uh, our national security and defense policy? But then I've heard China, 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 China. You know, and I'm reminded of uh, something Henry Kissinger and others said. You know, in Europe and the United States, we may think we're living in a beautiful sort of Kantian peace here. In, in a, in a, in a post-Westphalian world, we don't have to worry about conflict between nation states. But then you look at Asia, and you see powers almost ready to go to war over a, a collection of rocks uh, in the middle of the ocean. Uh, so the nation state is not, it's not gone from the picture. And you know, Admiral Walsh, General Scales went back and forth on this. Is China really going to be the primary threat? Um, you know, and I think that's a question, you know, we, we really, really are gonna have to wrestle with that. And I was so encouraged, uh, I think my, uh, one of my, my students, Ryan Swick, who uh, was working here earlier today, is already gone, but one of the things that warmed my heart, I passed by his, uh, his workstation the other day and he was working hard on his Chinese. <laughs> he was really doing his Chinese lessons.